Hello, 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 hello. Wow, it is so nice to see you all. I'm trying to see you in one go. Hello and welcome. Welcome to this free session for foodies. So we do we have foodies in the house? Yay. <laughs> um, if you like, you can switch on your camera so I, I don't feel so alone. But if you feel uh, more comfortable without your camera on, then uh, feel free to stay anonymous. That is really fine. Um, so let's take a little moment for everybody to hop on board in the last few minutes. Um, so I see some nice familiar faces and I see some new faces. Hi, Yasan. <laughs> nice to see you again. And I see some of my online students in the Creative Strategies for Pirates course. And I see some of my students of the Food and Design Dive course. And I see some uh, people I probably have met along the way, somewhere during the, the years, <laughs> somewhere in the past, and um, that I really hope to meet again very soon, especially in real life, where hugs are involved. Um, so uh, Yasan is already starting this, but I also want to know from all of you, where are you watching this from? So where are you right now? Uh, where is your seat? I guess we are all sitting. We shouldn't be. Maybe next time we do a standing up session, like walking in the woods, that you can only join if you're walking in the woods. Ah, uh, let's see, we've got uh, Copenhagen, Michael, welcome. You are from Milan again, hi, hi, Nina from Canada, Paul from Melbourne, Australia, nice to see you, and Anne Christine, nice to see you again. And there we have Roger or Roger from Amsterdam, and Talia from Peru, and Almari from Cape Town, South Africa, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Dusseldorf. Amsterdam, Valencia, Taipei, Freising, Germany, Marseille, France, and another Amsterdam. Wow, that is so amazing that we're here together with such an amazing international group of foodies. Um, I can't see you all in one screen, uh, so if you want to ask something, interrupt me during this session, or just like shout something, um, feel free to do that in the chat. I really enjoy it when you just uh, ask your question or make your comments and make this into a conversation instead of just me um, blurping out to you guys. Um, I also have some questions for you to start with. Um, so we're starting with some questions because I want to make this an interactive conversation. Um, then I'm also going to share some examples from my own practices. And in the end, I will be sharing with you some tools and techniques that you can use um, as a foodie to enhance and develop your work and practice with intuitive design tools. And I think it is so incredibly important to understand how you can use those and in what way you can use those to enhance your daily practice. Because I see 
a lot of foodies doing amazing things, but I also see a lot of foodies struggling, especially in this time of an, of an international pandemic, especially in the time where you actually needed to all right, please mute yourself if you haven't done that. Yeah, I see so many people with wonderful ideas who just just do not manage to get them to the next level. So with this um, session, I am aware that I can't solve everything, but I do want to give you some tools. I do want to give you some tricks and tips and especially some very tangible uh, results that you can take to the next step in your practice, all right? Uh, so this is uh, why we're all here. And I just want to say, I really appreciate that you take some time in your busy schedule, because I know that everybody is incredibly busy and that we all have so many things to do and that the online sessions in the world are um, endless and that you can spend uh, a full life online uh, watching things. So I just want to say, I really appreciate that you're here uh, and doing this for you because this session is really not about me, it is about you. It's about how you can improve on your practice. So that is very important for me um, to be aware of that this is something you do for yourself. And uh, that's also why I really encourage you to ask questions because Try to take as much out of this session as you can. Um, so now I think everybody is more or less on board. Um, what I want to ask you to start with is um, like how many of you, and I'll, I'll change to gallery view so I can see you. How many of you are would consider yourself uh, a designer? And you can, you can raise virtual hands, perhaps that's the easiest. Or do we have designers here too? And how many of you know more? Yeah. Seven, about seven. Um, so I want to emphasize this is a session for foodies. And so you don't have to walk out of this session, but it is not aimed at designers. It's really aimed at people who are professional foodies, but I know that, you know, you can be both, right? Um, so who of you would consider themselves a foodie as a, like, like the majority of your work? Food-oriented professional. And you know, I'm saying foodie, and uh, this can be anything. All right, so some people raising both hands. Yeah, that's the majority of this group. That's great to see. Um, now I know I'm talking to the people I, I wish to talk to right now. So that's good to know. And the nice question, the nicer question is, um, what do you like the most about, um, what do you like the most, what do you like to do the most when you work with food? What do you like about working with food? What specifically, draws you to working with food and and i still see the hands it's okay you can lower them now <laughs> i've seen it and you can type that in the chat so just type in the chat what draws you to working with food what excites you there what made you start to work with food in the first place food is omnipresent dara says yeah giving love and care to people through food Beautiful. Uh, less waste. I guess, Ray Ray, you mean that you want to create something with less waste than normal or with than products? Maybe you can expand a little bit on that. Karen says techniques, uh, improving in that creativity, pleasure, beauty, taste. Yeah. Yasan says to create meaningful connections with people. Uh, ah, Dara says it's from banal to resonance. Yeah, I love that. Uh, Caroline says, food is life. Yeah, yeah, that's why we do it, right? To create events and bring people together. Yeah, sharing, multisensorial play, 
everything about food I love, Irmina says, but especially the history. Yeah. Bringing people together, Paro says, the gathering. Um, Ines says, love is an internationally love is an internationally understood language across generations. Uh, and I think Ines, you write love and you mean food and love. Um, that's what I that's what I guess, but I also know you, Ines, so I, I guess I'm correct here. Uh, creativity and creation in the real world for real people, Pauline, yes. Multiple sensory, yeah, connection, healing, creative, multi-sensory. Yeah, the vitality of life is the vitality of eating, Dara says, yeah. UA says, always knowing more by accident. Yeah. Food is full of surprises, oh, yeah. Okay. And satisfies so much of my curiosity towards the world. That is really well put, yeah. Ermina says to read about food, yeah. And in the end, all the end, all the products and cut-ups will be eaten, yeah. And Ray Ray, you mean less waste is created, yeah. Pauline says understanding and combining flavors and Dara says it cannot be owned. Wow, what an abundance of great insights, reasons why we love working with food. And, and, and I'm, I'm so excited to read this because this is exactly what makes me so excited and so happy about working with food. Um, yes, Irina, yeah, like everything that you're writing fires me up as well. And I do believe that we all share this. We see why food is exciting. We see why food brings us what, we, uh, what we're looking for. So then my next question is, these are the things that excite you about food, right? This is why you were drawn to start with food to work with food in the first place, then how much of your time, like percentage wise, are you working on this very thing that you love about food? How much of your time are you spending on that connection? How much time are you spending on um, the sensorial aspects of, of, of food? And I'm, 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 and we don't do this to compare we just do this to understand what we're doing. Um, and I think it's really important to, if you want to learn and improve on your work, on your business, then it's really crucial that you start to assess what it is that you do exactly. So you also understand where your growth is. Um, and, Ka and Gado says, the stories we tell with food define us, yeah. Um, Ermina says, sometimes hours a day, like how much percentage? I want to be more precise. Yasan says 30 approximately, yeah. UA says 20 to 30, Roger 60. Uh, Michael, not enough, sadly far from enough. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate that you are honest about that you know we're not here to show off we're not here to um to to make this a contest uh, i think the more honest you can be about those things the more ability you have to grow so we're in a safe space here we all i think have the same passions but we might also have the same struggles um dara says a lot of nuts and bolts rather than syrup roll uh, cerebral. Yeah, what is the percentage? Flutus says 24-7. So that would be 100%, right? Uh, Paul says not enough. It's hard to devote enough time to the core creativity around other things. Probably 30 to 40%. Yeah, that's a very um, like correct uh, way to look at it. Um, Ray Ray says three hours teaching a week, a lot more just to prepare for it. Yeah, 30% most of my lifetime. Yeah, but of course you're also doing other things and that is also fine. And you're also here um, looking for, I think looking for inspiration to develop and grow towards something. Like if you didn't want any, if you were already doing this for 100%, then probably you wouldn't uh, be on this training. Uh, Pauline says 
10%, 10%, 2030, yeah. Uh, home tastings, yeah. Uh, three hours, three hours in a week or in a day or in, in a year. Yeah, all right. Uh, 70 nuts, cerebral 30, yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, I think this is really good too. And I wonder how much time you really do that to really um, wonder like what it is that you want to do, what it is why you actually started doing a certain thing and then also sometimes to take a step back and to look at what are you really doing exactly and what is um, and what is the result of that? Like, are you, are you steering your life or are you like going with whatever comes to you? Um, I would like to know, like my next question, this is a little quiz. I would like to know, what keeps you in your life from actually reaching the 100% of working on what you love? Because we found like why we love working with food. We were um, dissecting like how much time of my, um, of my daily job am I really working on what I love about food? And what is keeping you from actually going to 100%. Like what is specifically that stands in your way? Uh, Miguel says to find clients, yeah. Dara says the trappings of day-to-day -day stuff. Ermina says there, are, there is more I love. Yeah, absolutely, that could be. And then Ermina, my question is, are you then, like if there is the full 100% of time in your life, are you then all this 100% working always on all these things that you love? Or perhaps there are other things. Uh, Jason says practicality, marketing, budgets, time, space, constraints, yeah. Uh, UA says the fear of failure, fear of to achieve nothing in the end, yeah. UA, I really appreciate that you shared that because I know that more people are dealing with that and that it's not easy to actually um, share that, but yeah, it is something that I know happens a lot with creatives. Uh, day stuff, other commitments, fear. Uh, Karen says age, energy. Yeah, yeah, that's very relevant. Uh, money, Talia says, yeah. Expanding from a hobby to a monetized business. Needing to be able to support oneself while not having a large network. Yeah, it's always a growing business, right? It is also always something which is in progress. I wonder if there really is a moment where, like, where you, where you've made this thing, because there's always things that you want to improve on. There's always things that you are seeking after. And that's also the exciting things that there are always ways to grow and you're always making process. Uh, Ermina says, shame. Um, I don't know, Irmina, if you, if you write down shame, what kind of shame you mean exactly, but I am very familiar with shame. I've, I've experienced a lot of shame myself and I know that it can be very paralyzing. So I really appreciate that you're here um, to see if there are ways that you can actually work your, your way out of that because it is really a shame to feel shame, but I'm aware that it's something that can really restrict your steps. Uh, mind space, uh, concentration, um, and day-to-day -day things again, family stuff, yeah. Uh, otherwise, pretty much I am exploring all the time, sometimes in simple ways. Yeah, great, Pauline, yeah. Um, food is limited and people think it is superfluous. Um, mm, yeah, I'm not sure, is that the thing that is keeping you or restraining you? That is a, that is a question. Um, so my next question in this little quiz um, is I want to ask you if you could imagine 
what your life would be if you would have solved that obstacle. So if you would, if you would just take a moment and don't think about all the struggles or all the things that are standing in your way, um, or like how then would you, how would you solve that? That doesn't matter for now. For this question, I just want to ask you, imagine that all these things are magically solved. You don't know how, doesn't matter. Can you, in a few words, describe what your dream job would be then? How would it, what would it look like? What kind of things would you, would, would you be doing? What kind of clients would you have, for example? And do you have a notebook with you? Because maybe just let's wait for a minute. Let's not type this in the chat directly. But let's just do, do a little exercise here because I think this is so incredibly useful to take a moment to not think about your daily struggles. And we just take like four or five minutes and we will write down, and you can start this question with what if, what if I would lead my dream job life? And then you can just start to write down, what would it be? What kind of things would you do? What would your office look like if you have an office? Maybe you would just like dance in the field, but what kind of clients would you have? What kind of people would you meet? Just take a moment to allow yourself to go into this fantasy. And really, really allow yourself to, to, to go big. You don't have to limit yourself. Uh, there is someone uh, who's not muted. I don't know who, but please, if you see that you're not muted, then just uh, do that, please. So we have some thinking space in our in our ears. <laughs> All right. So just one more minute of dreaming about what would your ideal food job look like? What would it entail? It doesn't even matter if it exists in reality. All right, so just take a moment to read through what you have been dreaming up for yourself. And, and remember, this is your vision. It's your dream, no one else's. So just own it. It's your, your creation. When you go through that and just when you read it, you, you can really feel that this could be a reality. So allow yourself to also like feel about how exciting this would be if this would actually be true. And I know like we're so many times we're just rushing through our lives, not really thinking about what we would want or where we would want to go. Many times we're only thinking about how to get to the next step, but not really thinking about what it really is that we want. We're so busy 
solving like riddles and puzzles and running and doing our daily life jobs that we sometimes forget like why we started working with this in the first place and where we really want to go to and what we need to do to actually make space for this vision to happen. So when you went through this, um, maybe you can share like just a couple of words or maybe one or two sentences in the chat, like that we have like a feeling for what we are all dreaming of. Us as this kind of international group of amazing foodies together, what are we, what do we want to do? How, what would that look like? Uh, Thomas say, is saying, creating food events in unconventional places. Yeah, small groups, tastings, create food pairings, food still life photography. That sounds cool. I want to join. <laughs> what else? What else? Just, um, just share whatever you want to share. Dara says, uh, be in a place where people come to explore their emotions through food. Yes, yes, that sounds amazing. Uh, Paul says, owning a charcuterie shop, deli, where I work on my own butchery, creating new flavors and food combinations. Operating within Melbourne, being the food capital of Australia, but servicing, offering food to as far as possible by the use of the internet. Eventually get, get to the point where I could have a book or more published. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that way of dreaming. That's amazing. I would love this to happen with my brother so that we can both pursue our passions together. Wow, baking and patisserie. That is amazing. That is amazing. That sounds lovely. Uh, Pauline says, work as a chef on plant-based creative cooking, using whole foods in a creative environment with people from who I can learn. Yeah, wow. Karen is very specific. I love that. Four times a month. Five to 20 people in natural outside settings meet and eat gatherings where people are surprised by beautiful fun and vegetarian food. Wow, I wish we could all, right, all have this already now. Happiness, creative flow, a food experience kit, retail space across major international cities, leading to an experimental kitchen and eating space, a collaborative workspace and an edible backyard garden. Yes, Han, that is amazing. Actually, I talked about your network today in a, in a Beijing lecture. Um, so you might expect some Chinese uh, people coming. Uh, Michael says, help SME quality developers grow and develop their products and have my own side production of a few seasonal products. Yes, wow, that sounds great. USS develop long-term research about food culture to nourish my own archive. Work for human beings instead of clients. Yes, I will have 100% freedom of choosing who or what I want to contribute to, not to satisfy, but to change meaningfully. Wow, that's a beautiful description, you were. I think you're already on your way. Uh, Tamara says, Alcoholics Anonymous, meetings with food as a guiding light to mindfulness. That is a great idea, wow. Carolyn says, inspire people globally in online food videos and chocolate tastings. Hmm. Mika says, I have a wonderful garden with a roof in the center of Ghent. It would be a place where people can meet each other all year round, outdoor in each season and other atmosphere and seasonal food. An inspiring place where food and design comes together. Wow. Irmina says, nice house in not too big a town like Dordrecht. <laughs> yeah, for those of you who doesn't know, I am in a very small town in the Netherlands that almost no one knows. And it's actually really nice, but shh, don't tell anybody. Uh, doping my historical courses and writing about food, but also intimate dinners with beautifully prepared dishes. The same on a small farm or Trullo in Apulia. Wow, Irmina, that sounds great. What a great visions you have here, people. This is amazing. Wouldn't it be great if all of this would already exist and then we would all go and visit each other and have each other's experiences. So I would like that so much. So when I read this, I get, I get really excited and I can imagine that you are actually getting excited as well. So I want to ask you, um, 
how are you, and maybe this is a bit of a slightly complicated question and not easy to answer in a few sentences, but I want you to try. Uh, are you using a specific method to develop your career towards the vision that you were just sharing now? And maybe you can first answer with yes or no. Are you using a method to achieve, to get to this vision? That's my first yes or no. Yes, UA says. Rodu says no. Yeah, no, yes, yes. <laughs> Great, yeah. Yeah. Didn't have time, now I do, no, yeah. All right. Because I see a lot of people who have a dream about where they want to go. They have this passion, they have this love for what they do, but they seem to get stuck in daily life. They seem to get stuck in all the practical things that need to be done. And that actually takes them from finally moving to where they actually want to go to. And I also see that there are a lot of creative people, uh, a lot of food people who, had, who are creative, but haven't had a, uh, or are not designers or haven't had like an art education um, officially, but are like creative, enthusiastic people who are really good at doing their food work, but they kind of struggle to get to that, to get to that edge, to get to that, um, to that place where their business, where their practice, where their profession is really standing out. And I see that if you are either just making bulk, if you are a foodie just like wanting to produce, then, then that's not an issue because that's, you can do that. But when you are a foodie with a desire to create more than only something like a food item, which there's nothing wrong. Like, let, let me just be very straightforward about that. There is nothing wrong with um, creating like amazing food. And that is the thing that you want to do. That is great. But I also know that there are a lot of people who want to move a little bit outside of the pure food creation and who want to move into a more creative space. They want to set up um, experiences, restaurants. Uh, uh, they want to um, create all these visions. And either they take the big leap and jump into something fully and succeed. But I see a lot of people who stay somewhere in the middle. And this is actually the place where people get in friction. So if you either stay in pure production or you go all the way to the other side where you, you create this powerful concept that is like mind blowing, then, then you don't have to deal with a lot of of course, in daily life, there are things to deal with, but it's very clear what you do. And I see a lot of people who are kind of in the middle and who are trying to move from the production side to going to the more creative side, but just end up in the middle. And the thing there is that if this happens, you attract confusion. You attract clients who um who see that you're doing something creative but who want to kind of mess around with that uh i'm sure you know like um these kind of clients that love to have something very special but they don't want to pay anything more than like the regular producer right do you know those just like am i maybe that's just me like these are ones that i have and uh, encountered a lot when I wasn't clear about my position. So when I was doing catering and it was like creative catering, 
I, I was doing production, but it was also more than that. It was also an experience, but it wasn't like, it was still kind of unsure because I just started with my business. And while that was kind of unsure, I saw that I was attracting people who were also unsure. Was it their fault? Was it their fault that they told me like, yeah, I really love all that creative stuff, but actually, you know, our logo is green. So can you also make all the desserts green because our logo is green? And this is something that happens when you do not have a strong conceptual position. You get clients who want to have creative stuff but do not want to pay for it. You get clients who are going to interfere with, um, with your creative choices. Uh, and then there's also clients who love to see you do more special things, but who just finding it a little bit scary and then want you to like tone it down to make it more acceptable for their guests who are just a little bit scared. And I used to think when I was in that middle, I used to think it was the fault of the clients. I got really upset with all these stupid people that didn't understand that what I was doing. I didn't realize that it was actually me and the way that I was dealing with my business and the way that I was positioning myself, that that was causing people to behave like that. Do you understand what I talk about? Are you with me on this? Do you know these kind of people? Have you met some of them? Yes. And it's super annoying, isn't it? <laughs> you mean yes, no, most people say yes. So what I've noticed is that my initial reaction when, when I was at that space was to actually go and cater for these people. So would, I would either lower my prices I would change the concept a little bit so that they would be happy. I would make it like, I would make maybe that pink uh, logo on something. <laughs> and that would make me really annoyed. Like personally, I, 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 I really hated that. But I also didn't make good quality work. And that's the stupid thing. So you think you're actually doing something well because this is what the client wants. But the moment you do that, the moment you indulge in saying, I will lower my price. Yeah, I will make it more acceptable. Yeah, I will add um, balloons inside my design because for some reason that's what you want. Um, to have people interfere with your prices, with your concepts, or with the execution of your concept, you think that you're doing something because your client is, will be happy with that. But what you are doing is you are becoming a magnet for more and more of these kind of clients because you are diluting your quality. You are diluting your creative conceptive work. So the moment I decided after like, falling and, 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 and being annoyed and making lots and lots of amazing mistakes. After I decided that I would say no and that I would purely choose for my creative quality to bring my food practice to a level that was, uh, that was um, much higher than what these people were asking for, I, did, I never had these kind of clients again. Because either the same people started to see the quality that they couldn't see before, which wasn't their fault, which was my fault. They would come back and would be happy to pay for it. And I would be attracting new clients who recognized, um, uh, who recognized um, quality and who recognized conceptual uh, quality so it was quality in the work itself and conceptual quality and who wanted to be challenged to do things differently so by 
going out of this middle part where you are in the middle between production work and conception work. Um, and I'm not saying that if you move to creative conception that you don't produce anymore, don't get me wrong. Uh, you will probably produce much more uh, with the help of a team, but you need to have clarity about where you are. Are you in the middle trying to go from one place to the other? And are you doing justice to yourself? Or are you just taking that leap and then taking the consequences and doing that very clearly? That is a um, question that I have for you. Um, yes, Paul, that is so true. And that is something that I experienced very literally. Um, yeah, Roger, that's a great question. The thing is that um, that is the reason why people stay in the middle because they are afraid of losing the money. But the thing is that there are a lot of potential clients. There are always more clients in the world than you can even handle. And there are a lot of pot potential clients that all don't even come near you if you are not clear in what you do. So the moment you move to this other place where you have a very pure and very clear vision of what you do, then you will find that people will, will find you like bees and honey. And what happens is that your, uh, your fees will raise. So you need to do less actual jobs to have more time, to have more money. And if you create that for yourself, you also have space to think about the next steps, to think about the clarity and what will happen naturally then is that your work becomes better because you have more space, more mental space to actually think about the next steps. So um, Roger, this is like a, a loop. If you're afraid of losing the money, then you will get stuck in that loop. So you need to first have the clarity, then do whatever is necessary to do that and then you will find that it naturally flows. Um, so I just want to, um, to, to, to go a little bit into uh, what is then design or creativity, because uh, I know that I talk about food and design because I have a design background, uh, but I also have had restaurants for many years. So I also have a lot of uh, food experience. Um, but for me, design is not um, about making pretty things. And I know that a lot of people think that that is what design is. So I might sometimes mix creativity and design, but these words for me simply mean the ability to make an idea tangible. That is what I would call creativity or design. And so it doesn't mean that you have to create things physically. It doesn't mean that you have to create objects. It doesn't mean that you have to make beautiful cakes or whatever. Um, all these things, making something beautiful, the aesthetics of eating is a tool. It is a tool to communicate with a client. That is why you make something beautiful, but it's not your goal. The goal of creative thinking is to create experiences, to create services, to create food, to create objects, to create products or projects that just give people a different angle to see things in a different way. I think that is the true power of design and design thinking. Um, and, and I'm not sure, are you with me on that? Do you have different ideas around that and just let me know because I think it's very important. I want to share my screen with you and share some examples of how you can use design in a way to maybe not even make something new and sometimes specifically not making something new, but to actually create a new way of looking at things. And I think this is so crucial because this can make you so much money as well and give you such great clients. If you find the ability 
to find a new angle on something instead of just working harder to make more or pleasing more clients. If you can just take a step back and use a design brain to make a different position of something that people thought they already knew, but you just placed it in front of them just a little bit different so they have a completely new experience, then you can use design in a way to improve your uh, to improve your food business uh, that can become extremely profitable also in times of COVID. Um, yeah, Paul, so this is a, a, a great thing you're saying that because I know that many people are thinking this and I understand the misconception because the word design is used so much when it comes to like beautiful cars and beautiful glasses and all these kind of um, aesthetic things. And, 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 and yes, that is a part of design, but I want to show you that design can be a way of thinking so that when you apply that to food, you don't necessarily need to make this shiny thing, but you can actually in a very simple and many times even very cheap way, create quick results. That is what I, uh, I'm here for to tell you. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely, Paul. So I, I think that's a really good comment that you're uh, stating there, yeah. Um, so let me just um, share my screen with you to just give you some examples. Uh, and I don't want to make this like a full lecture about my work. Uh, where is it, where is it? Um, Where is my idea? I don't want to make this like a, a full um, lecture about my work, but I want to use my work uh, and, and it's not just my work, like many of my colleagues are doing things like this. I want to show to you um, how thinking differently about something can give you tremendous benefit and how you can use that for your own business. And uh, so maybe you've seen some of the projects already before the ones that I'll be showing you, but I will not be talking about the projects themselves so much as I will be talking about the mechanisms behind them and how they can really, um, how they arrive from a very simple way of thinking and have a huge effect, all right? Um, so um, this is a Christmas dinner. Uh, well, this, this is just a sketch, uh, but this is what I want to share with you first is a Christmas dinner I once did. And, um, and it came from the idea that I think that Christmas is already so overloaded with um, Christmas decorations and all these kind of uh, generic ideas about um, pine trees and, um, and, 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 and also types of food. Um, that I, I actually didn't want to make a Christmas dinner for a very, very long time. And then I was thinking, well, you know, Christmas dinners are very typical. They have like very typical rules. But if you can look at what Christmas really is about, if you look at the essence of Christmas, you see that Christmas is not about like luscious banquets and Christmas is not about decoration. Christmas is about being together and about sharing together and about human connection. That is really only thing that Christmas really is about. So what I decided to do is to make a Christmas dinner. And this was a commission by, uh, by Droog uh, in, in Amsterdam. Um, what I decided to do is to create a dinner for 40 strangers. And we invited to a table where normally a tablecloth is hanging down you know, it is on the table and it hangs down to the floor. And now we took it up into the air and we made some slits in it. Um, and so um, this is the situation. This is, this is the table, the Christmas setting. And this is um, how people would interact with that. So they were sitting like with their heads through the tablecloth and with their hands uh, through it as well. Well, and I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily here to explain the whole concept there, but um, 
what happened here is very interesting because this was such a different setup from regular dinners that people felt uh, it was kind of scary to be in this setting with your, with, you know, you look kind of silly with only a head and two hands. Um, but to be in this situation together created an instant effect of feeling connected because also physically you could feel each other in this tablecloth. But you can also see it's actually, it's a very simple setup. The, the tablecloth goes in, up into the air um, instead of falling to the floor. So uh, all in all, it's not like a very complicated thing to do. Um, and this is uh, the same uh, project in Tokyo uh, where um, we also invited uh, 40 strangers. And I actually prefer the, 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 the picture of the back because when you go to the bathroom, then you see all these, these bags. But what you see is here is that such a simple intervention created a very powerful change within, um, within the um, emotion of the guest. Uh, especially in Tokyo, I could sense that when people arrived, everybody was behaving very formal. Um, but the moment that people actually stepped into the setting and put their heads through the tablecloth, it was just as if by doing this, their masks were falling off. And everybody was becoming really open and very playful and very interactive and very social. And you can see here that the food is very simple as well. Uh, everybody on the side of this lady's side of the table uh, has the same food. All of this is raw, um, sweet melon, and her plate is cut in two. And it's nothing fancy, it's just an Ikea plate that we cut in two. It's not really like high design. And everybody on the opposite side of the table has uh, raw ham. Uh, and, and most people know that raw ham and melon is a classical Italian combination. So people start to share their dishes. You don't have to give any instructions, people just start to do that naturally. We did the same thing as well with tomatoes and mozzarella, for example. And there are many of these kind of classical combinations that just belong together. Uh, so you can, you, you can use that in sharing. Um, and for the main course, the first person would get yeah, like a huge piece of rib. Uh, the next person would get a whole lettuce a clean lettuce, but then there would be croutons and dressing and everything on top. The third person would get a whole pumpkin stuffed with seeds from the oven and the last person would get potatoes. Well, and this is like very rudimentary food. Uh, and what I notice is that, first of all, people are social animals. So people start to cut everything up and to share it. So that's very nice because it, it really helps them to um, interact with each other. It really helps them to start to create this bond amongst each other. <coughs> but what I noticed that also in the kitchen, this was incredibly easy to do. You know, you don't have to make lots of portions. You just make one big thing on one plate. So uh, practically thinking like this also meant that in our logistics in the kitchen, um, we had a really easy job because we could just like make these big things and people would get them themselves. It's much easier than to make a whole plate and put everything on separately. So what is interesting to see is that many times these kind of simple interventions that are um, conceptually quite powerful, they also have, they can, it doesn't, it's not always the case, but it can have also a result in the log logistics in your kitchen, which makes it uh, very nice to, uh, to execute. Um, and another thing here is that uh, I did some of these dinners um, and you know, sometimes just thinking differently. So here you might think, yeah, okay, but you needed to design this structure. Well, you can quite easily work with uh, someone who knows how to do that. You, you don't have to design the whole structure. You can just make the simple drawing like the, the first one uh, I made in the beginning with you know, things going up in the air instead of going down to the floor. That's like the easiest thing to, that you can do. But sometimes it can be as easy 
as giving people a um, corsage. Um, so in one of those dinners, when people would enter the space, we would give them a corsage with a little flower, uh, but we also had a name tag on the corsage. And this is something that, you know, it's quite, um, it, it's quite easy to do. And uh, many times when people do not know each other, it's helpful to know, you know, what is your name? But what we did is we, we just gave people random names. So the whole evening, um, you would be like maybe Barbara, or you would suddenly be called Tom, or I don't know what kind of name. So also male, female, random. The funny thing is that a tiny little thing like that doesn't cost you any extra money, but it creates a tremendously different experience for people who are there. Because I, I noticed that people didn't only just like found it funny, and they started instantly talking to others because it was a great icebreaker because you, you could now say, oh yeah, I guess you're not, not really Cherry. I think actually your name is probably different. Like what is your name? Or don't you want to tell me? So that's a really kind of easy way to start communicating. Um, but I also noticed that, that you actually feel different when you have a different name. So physically you also have a kind of new avatar that you can start to explore. So these kind of things, I do call that design. It's design thinking. It's not necessarily creating a new shiny car. It is just thinking differently about processes and then using them and executing them in a very simple way. Uh, some other like really small interventions that had really a big effect is, for example, just putting forks on long rods with a ribbon around it and then putting them outside in the grass and put some snacks on top of it. And you know, the wind will play with it and they will start to like bounce in the wind uh, and it will be a great installation, but it's not complicated. It's actually very cheap to do, to get forks and put them on rods and then put them in the ground. Um, and you know, you can make some nice pictures with that. Uh, this is in Senegal. We actually took them to Senegal. Uh, and you know, you can also just have lots of spoons. And instead of like, like putting food on the horizontal um, place, you can put, uh, and Tamara, would you mind to mute yourself, please? I can't seem to do that now. Um, you can also move the food to the vertical space and then have lots of spoons and just put them on the wall with gaffer tape. You know, you can copy all these ideas, but what I want to challenge them to do, challenge you to do, is to start to train yourself to think differently so you can come up with those kind of things, so you can come up with kind of simple ideas that have a profound different effect on people. And here's something else, you know, you can make lollipops um, and sell them, but you can also make sugar guns that show what sugar does. Okay, so yeah, log in and then I'll see you back on here when it's over. Yeah, Francesca, please see me here when it's over. Um, and you can make sugar spoons as well and stir them in your hot beverage and then they yeah. melt so you don't have any dishes to do. Francesca, would you mind to, to mute yourself, please? Oh, sorry. Um, that's okay. Um, and, you know, you can make marshmallows and sell them, but you can also make, make marshmallow icebergs and tell people that when they melt, they give you inner global warming when you put them in your hot beverage. Like all these things are extremely simple, but they give all your projects such a... Um, profound higher value. And it's the same amount of work making icebergs as making other kinds of um, marshmallows. Um, and and this, is, this is an example, I put this example here because I really want to show you that design is not necessarily about making products. Design can really be about a way of thinking. So this is a project I did with my daughter when she was about three years old. I've got three kids. 
and this is my oldest daughter, but she's now 16. Uh, but here she was about three years old and um, she didn't want to eat her vegetables. And for me as a mother, that was really frustrating. And there were two things that I noticed. First of all, if I would put her at the dining table, for her, that was a cue to already start to resist that she didn't want to eat her vegetables. And I think it is because three-year-old children, they don't have that much to say about their lives, right? So when they, um, hey, Shekal, can you please mute yourself? Um, let's, I don't have to do that, yeah. Hey, Chantal, can you mute yourself? How are you? All right. How are you? All right. You hear me? Mute yourself. Hello. Hey, hi, how are you? Can you please mute yourself? Yes, I'm uh, present myself, you mean? No, no, to shh, mute. Sorry, sorry, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. All right. Um, so, um, so I respect the attitude. Like when you're three years old, you don't have that much to say about your life, that not eating vegetables can have a big effect on your mother. That is really useful, right? But for me, that was really annoying. So I found that I needed to find a different place to actually get her to taste these vegetables. Uh, another thing that I noticed is that I uh, read a lot of uh, psychological research. And I have read that when you taste something seven times, um, or, or it takes about seven times of tasting before you accept a new flavor. So you just taste and you taste and you taste. It's like learning a new language. Um, so I thought I need to make sure that she tastes something at least seven times and that I find a new place for her to eat. So what I did is I invited her with all of her friends from the daycare to come to my studio. And we had this huge table full of vegetables. And there um, uh, I told the kids we were going to do a workshop, a jewelry making workshop or a bling bling workshop. Um, and the tools that they could use to actually create the jewelry were their teeth. So they could shape all the vegetables using their teeth. And by doing that, um, they, were, they were eating, but to them, it didn't feel that they were eating. It felt as if they were playing. And what really struck me that there was not a single child that was like chewing and making a shape and that was spitting the food out. Not a single child did that. All of them, they were shaping, they were making kind of earrings, all these kind of things. And they were just swallowing and eating all the vegetables. And, and honestly, there was a little boy who was, who was making a bracelet, but then he was daydreaming and he was just looking the other way and he just ate the whole bracelet. So afterwards, um, my daughter really started to improve her curiosity towards vegetables. And I also asked the other parents and also their children started to become much more uh, accepting to vegetables. And why I want to show this is that this doesn't cost more, uh, this doesn't cost any design product uh, kind of um, knowledge. This just costs a little bit of time and attention and a lot of vegetables and um, that's all. So design is really about finding new angles to things that you might already know. So here's another one based on um, uh, um, behavioral science. Apparently humans have a really hard time to really see the amount of food which is on the plate. So we overeat a little bit every day. So I created these objects that you can put in, in the middle of the food so you actually eat less because visually you think the, the plate is more full. So yeah, these things are uh, like a product design, but you can also use stones 
and put them between your food. You can also put other kinds of objects that are food safe and put them between your food. There are so many more ways that you can play with food, that you can make food more interesting and that you can do things that actually do not require literal designing. The only thing that they need or that they require is to think differently. Another, uh, and this is the last example that I'll be sharing, um, is the national tap water tasting. In the Netherlands, we have the most pure tap water in the world, um, but most people don't think of it. Most people actually just like open their taps and um, you know flush their toilets with drinking water, take showers with drinking water, uh, they wash their cars with drinking water, but the appreciation for drinking water uh, is very low. Uh, many people even buy bottled water, while um, that the quality of bottled water in many cases is less than comes from the tap. So why are Dutch people not so appreciative of tap water? And um, well, you can wonder why, but you can also wonder how can we make them more appreciative? So what I did is to not talk about, you shouldn't waste water because I think no one actually answers or listens to that. But I started to look at the different flavor varieties of the different kinds of tap water from various cities and regions because um, you can see that when you travel through the Netherlands, that all the tap waters from every di different city is slightly different, but no one ever talks about the taste. Everybody only talks about, well, people don't, they just don't talk about tap water. They only talk about that they shouldn't waste it, but that's really it. So the moment you start to treat tap water like wine and talk about the terroir of it, because actually water has a terroir, um, then you can start to create a new narrative on a completely different level. And you can start to create understanding and appreciation for a product that normally people just flush through the toilet. And so here are some installations. And of course, yeah, these installations um, um, might be like uh, 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 look a little bit more designed, but in essence, what I really did was to just look at tap water and frame it in a different way. And that really doesn't require a lot of like literal designing. And it's really nice to have them all together and start to compare them because they are really different. So this is what I wanted to share just ex as examples. Um, as examples to show you that um, when you work with food, there are so many more different ways than to approach food and to deal with food than, uh, than I see being done. So when you think about yourself, when you think about this future vision that you were just making, are you incorporating these kinds of techniques to actually look at something, to turn it upside down and to frame it in a different way? And I just want to take a moment to see, like, are you still here? Are you still with me? Do you have questions or remarks before I will share with you some, um, what is it? Uh, yeah, it is six keys that you can use to use design thinking in your food work. I just need to take a sip. Thank you, Dara. <laughs> yeah, as a, as a uh, food and design die student, I'm sure you know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you have any questions, please, please uh, let me know. I'm happy to answer them. And otherwise we will move straight to um, to explaining to you what the six areas are, the six points that you can use 
as an intuitive design method, because I believe that this kind of design thinking, um, you can train that. You don't need to be a natural, skilled creative. If you have the tendency within your food work to go beyond the border of what, you know, what would normally be like food production, then you already have the quality and the creativity inside of you. You don't need to have like another education education to become a designer. I think there is a very simple um, method that you can use, which is very intuitive and that you can really apply to your situation. So you don't need to actually take another four years um, design uh, course uh, full time to um, to actually get to that same level. The only thing that you need to do is to make sure that you find and that you train this way of thinking, that you train this way of working and apply it to your specific skill set because you have an amazing skill set, you have an amazing vision. So the steps are already ahead of you. Um, and I think that is very cool. It doesn't require a lot. All right, so no questions so far. Um, I just need to check if I'm sharing everything I was preparing. Um, so you might want to write this down with me because um, I think it is extremely useful to take time in your daily work um, especially because I know, you know, we're all busy with um, daily tasks and with all the, the, the practical sides of our work, that you take some time when you, when you really are dedicated to move to the vision that you have. If you do want to spend this 100% on the thing that you love and not on all the other things, then make sure that you do invest your time in yourself, that you do invest your focus in yourself, that you invest in yourself to move towards that goal, to use a method and to take time to, um, to take that serious. You know, if you take your life serious, you've just got one life, right? So I, I want to go to all the things that you were just writing down. I want to go on this trip around the world and to have the charcuterie and I, I want to have this sensorial experience and all these things that you were talking about. I want you to succeed with that. And I want you to mute, guys. <laughs> all right, so number one um, of these six, keys to the intuitive design method for foodies is asking questions as an art. I see so many people who want to create something new, who either go as a first step, they go and take an internet search to see what is already there, and then they just go and copy. I'm sure you don't do that. I don't really mind when people copy things, but only copy things to improve them and only copy something if you feel that the thing that you're copying is reflecting authentically what you want to create in this world. But I see too many people who just go on an internet search and think, oh yeah, that looks kind of nice, let's do that. You don't have to do that because if you do that and you do not improve, you will still stay in this middle section. You will not move to this different section where you get a higher fee, when you, where you get your better clients and where you get more free time for yourself you will stay in this middle. You might move a little bit to that side, but you never really get out of there. So copying whatever is already there is only useful if you improve, 
But what I rather want you to do is to make an art of asking questions and especially asking for the obvious. And maybe you heard me tell this story before, but it's, it's just something I like so much. Um, my oldest daughter, actually the one that you saw in the, in the picture just now, um, when she was like about two years old or maybe three, maybe like similar age as you just saw her, um, she was watching her dad who was actually collecting the Christmas ornaments and putting them into a box. And she said, um, where, are you, where are you taking those? And he said, yeah, I'm going to put them in the attic so we can use them next year. And she said, next year? Will there be another Christmas next year? And I love that question because it implies that everything is possible that you don't really need to take things for granted. And you can see that the best innovations, for example, Amazon who decided to not invest into um, uh, advertising anymore and put the whole budget into free shipping and made their company explode. That was a practice of just asking questions, of asking the question, the questions that nobody dares to question or ask, like, is there another Christmas next year? Or um, do we really need marketing budget? Or do we need to do something else? Mm -hmm. So really daring to ask questions is one of the most profitable things you can do. Because I see, especially in restaurant business, all the years I have been working in and with restaurants and hospitality industry. I see that there are so many things that are being done only because, well, that's how we do it. That's how our client wants it. Well, we've always done everything like that. But do you really? Do you really need to do the things the way you did it? And aren't there other things to ways to do it? And the way to find out is to imagine you are the unknowing child the child that is just asking questions simply because maybe it can be different, who knows? So try to practice this, the art of asking questions and try to keep away from the, from the question from hell. <laughs> the question from hell is, what, what do you think the question from hell is? It's just three, Three letters. You can just type in the chat, just little little question for you. Almost, Paul, almost. Miguel. <laughs> Can't be done now. Why? No. Well, that's not really a question, is it? <laughs> it's a question. And uh, yes, yes, Pauline. Pauline has it. How? How is the, is the question that stops our brain? So if we want to find these new angles, these things that seem so obvious that we just have overlooked them, if we want to find those, then, the, then never allow yourself to start with thinking how. The how is something that you will solve later on. But I know a lot of people that the moment you start to question something in a business, then they say, well, I don't, well how should we do it differently then? <laughs> I don't know why suddenly that voice came to my mouth, but apparently people who ask a lot of hows always talk like that. So how is something for later? You can always solve so many things, but if you start to think about how, then you stay into, actually in your brain, you stay in beta brainwaves and you need to go to alpha and theta brainwaves to actually come up with new ideas. So asking open questions, for example, ask, what if, or wouldn't it be cool if, ooh, and then you get into that zone. The second thing is, and, and I think you're already 
experts in this, but I do want to encourage you to do this more, is create a vision. I know so many people who know what they like to do, they know what they enjoy doing, and they also know that they are right now doing, not doing what they, what they enjoy doing. They both know that, but they do not have a clear vision of what their perfect work life would look like. So what you did just now, these wasn't even five minutes of writing down the thing that you would like. I encourage you to spend on another day or maybe after this session to spend at least half an hour to an hour very precisely to not make a business plan. It's not about that. It is just about describing how would that be? With who would you like to be? How would that feel? What kind of clothes would you wear if that would be a reality? Actually, what you do is you allow yourself to daydream. You allow yourself to step into this almost created world. It's just not really there yet, but you have already constructed it. Why we do that is because when you do that, you prime your brain to start to notify you the moment there are opportunities that actually point into that direction. So strategically, it is incredibly important to have a vision, otherwise you can end up somewhere completely different. And if that's a good place, that is fine. But I see a lot of people at the end of their lives thinking, actually, I want it to be somewhere else. And if you are not taking charge of your life, then no one else will do it for you. So this is your choice. So create this vision. Do not make this a business plan because you don't know how you will end up there. You can just trust that the moment you will always redirect back to your vision. So write it down and read it, maybe every day, maybe once a week, but continue to remind yourself of a vision and that will help you to move in the direction where you want to go to. And also like literally you are priming your brains. You are making brain connections that you didn't have before. And that the moment you read it again and read it again will get thicker and deeper. Um, so it's, it's not just like a kind of spiritual thing to do. It is an actual practice that gets you to where you want to go. <laughs> um, so number three in this six points, what is it? Method, philosophy, you know, this is, this is just the start, right? You know, this is just a framework where you can step into. And I, I'm, I'm happy to uh, invite you after this session to tell you more about uh, some of the courses I'm doing with people to actually make them to go to this vision. Uh, but you're also, uh, absolutely invited to just take this framework and take it by yourself and make your steps necessary for you. So um, either way, uh, I'm just happy to be able to visit all your places and see all these wonderful things very soon in the future. Um, so number three is create a standard. Create a standard for yourself. I think this is one of the most beneficial and profitable things to do, to decide for yourself, like, what is my quality? Where, what do I stand for? When do I say no to a client who wants me, who wants to pull me down to their level where actually my level is here? And you know now that sticking to your level will attract the clients that appreciate that level and are also willing to pay for it. All right. Number four. Number four is to invest. Invest in yourself. Take this 
growth that you want towards your vision serious. And investing in yourself could have many uh, appearances. It could be that you need to become more fit physically. It could be that you need to uh, start training or start a different diet. It could be that you uh, need to go and do meditation or walk in the woods. Or it could be that you need to cook a different recipe every day. Or it could be that you need to invest in your network. It could be that you need to invest in a training or in a course or in a um, in a uh, an inspiration session or in a private coach. It could be that you need to invest time in actually not dealing with all these daily tasks and that you just need to invest time to actually think because most of these uh, great ideas that come from design thinking that change your business just by shifting perspective a little bit. Many of these things just come from having some mental space for yourself to think what would actually be the next step in my profession. Yes, Aya, it will be, it is recording and uh, I will put it uh, somewhere. Um, everybody who's on the mailing list will get a, a link to this session. It is a private link, so it's not public. And if you're not on the mailing list, then just send an email to uh, the address that you requested access to this uh, session as well. So you'll get it. Um, and then number five, is something that um, it, it sounds very obvious perhaps, um, but it is something that I see not that much of, and that is to actually be consistent. If you want to go there, if your GPS is pointed there, you can take you know all these turns and go back and forth, and you, you can have a lot of fun along the way, and you will probably learn a lot but it will take you longer to go to where you want to go. So consistency, if you need to train, train every day. If you need to um, train your customers that now your level has risen and that they need to pay more for you, then you probably need to train consistently and then people will move with you. But if you are not consistent, if you are moving back and forth, your clients will as well. Actually, you are attracting exactly the clients that you are radiating to. So the moment you decide to be consistent, the moment you decide to go for a certain level, the level that feels right for you, and it can be like, it can be anywhere that level, but it needs to be right for you. And you need to be consistent with that. Then you will also find in the outside world, that you will get the kind of clients and the kind of um, investment from that, those clients that you require. But you do need to stick with it and be consistent, especially if you've been going like all over the place for years, then it really re requires like quite a long time of consistency before you will notice that everything starts to flow with you. And then you can uh, approach this future vision um, like in easy steps, but you need to first commit to yourself that you'll be consistent. It's also a very simple promise to yourself. All right, so this is quite a long uh, story already, so I won't um, make it too long and, and I want to be respectful of your time. Um, but I do really like to share number six with you. And I think this is one of the most important um, points when it comes to a, an intuitive design method, which is play. P -L -A -Y. Play. We tend to take everything so incredibly serious that that also makes our brain stuck. We think that everything is serious. 
who have you actually ever in their life sent a quotation to a client but did it by singing a video actually you can do that and people really 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 like that and they will give you the job much easier if you can deal with things in a light way if you can play with things then you can also experiment then you can also find these different angles then you can also feel that things go in flow then your job doesn't feel like something that you have to do your job feels something that you get to do if you start playing again you start to trace back to why you started to work with food in the first place. Play is one of the most crucial keys to a creative mind, whether that is applied to food or applied to other topics. But yeah, food is the nicest, isn't it? <laughs> so these are the six the six keys for intuitive design and um, I am using these six keys um, in uh, my online course I'm starting a food and design dive foodie edition specifically for foodies I'm doing one specifically for designers right now and uh, I've done already quite a lot uh, without a specific um, tag to it, just like a food and design dive. And it's really incredible to see what people achieve with that, how people go from being a student to actually getting amazing um, uh, clients to um, making their dream projects come true, to exhibiting in uh, places that they never thought would be really true. So the results of the food and design dive are, um, yeah, overwhelming. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, the results are overwhelming and, uh, but I, I'm not here to advertise this. So I, I'm here to do uh, this training with you. Uh, so this was a training for now. But if you do want to know more about the dive, you can you can just uh, hang on a little bit and I'll uh, share a little bit more if you have questions about that. Um, but if you have questions about the training, let me know. I'm happy to answer anything. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Mika. So I'm really curious to see if you're going to, um, to use this in your future practice. So I guess uh, if you're still here, then uh, I can share a little bit about uh, the Food and Design Dive. Uh, some of you are here who are actually Food and Design Dive students. So that's really nice uh, to see you here. So um, what I'm doing is a uh, food and design dive uh, foodie edition. Uh, this is a 10 weeks course where we will look at how food and design um, can help you in your practice, but also like what it really is, what the potential is of this field. Because I see that people sometimes know a little bit about one specific angle but they don't actually see that there is a whole world of food and design that can be explored and that can also be used um, in your daily practice in a very simple and very understandable way. So the food and design that foodie edition is really there to make you acquainted with the field, but also to give you weekly challenges so that you can really start making things that you can really start actively engaging with the material and that you can really start to grow in this process and develop your own uh, specialism uh, within the field of food and design that links to what you're already doing now within food. Uh, so that is what it is about. Um, I will share a, uh, a link uh, to the course so you can have a look at it. 
And if you have um, any questions about it, then you can also just get in touch. We'll be starting. We'll be starting on the fourth of April. So that is um, in a little bit less than a month, and I'm so excited. Um, we'll be starting in a little bit less than a month. If you do want to jump in straight away, if you just know that this is something you want to do, um, if you jump in before the weekend, you get a free uh, coaching session, a one-on-one -on -one private coaching session with me. So we can go through what are you working on right now and how can we um, strategically help you to go to that next place. So that is um, in case you are, or you just want to go and hop on board straight away. So that is if you join before the weekend. So you still have like one and a little bit of a day. <laughs> Thank you, Jessan. Yeah, yeah, and Jessan um, and I have had some private coaching as well. That was a lot of fun, Jessan. And you're doing such great things right now. I'm really proud of you. So do you have any questions right now? Anything that you would like to know about food and design that you would like to know about the course or about the method? You can just um, get in touch uh, with me. Um, yeah, Ermina, uh, I have been posting about what the pupils do, um, the pupils, the students. Um, so if you follow me on Facebook and Instagram, you see that, yeah. All right. So um, I hope this has been use useful for you. Uh, if you want to continue with your training, if you really take this future vision serious, then uh, I do think it's worth to consider. Um, looking at the food and design that I've knowing now, I've done uh, already four of them and the results are overwhelming. Um, so if you really take your development serious, then I'm pretty sure that this can help you on your way to your, to actually already go there and be with your vision. So um, thank you. I'm going to say goodbye and Look forward to seeing you next time.